Whoa. Hi, uh, I'm Derek Burmel. I'm the artist in residence here at the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, I should have said it is my pleasure to be the artist in residence here at the Institute for Advanced Study. And um, uh, today, we, uh, I, there's been so many events at the Institute recently, I, I feel like I'm running from one thing to another. Uh, but it's, it's actually very wonderful at the same time. Um, and uh, today we have a special treat. Uh, this is kind of in, in collaboration with the Princeton Symphony uh, that we're having this little event here just uh, to introduce a concert that's going to be going on on Sunday, uh, which features a work of yours truly. Um, and uh, we're delighted to have the distinguished conductor, Rawson Milanoff, here with us uh, today. And he's going to talk a little bit about the, the piece that I wrote that is being performed uh, by the Princeton Symphony is Thracian Echoes. And this is a piece I wrote in 2002. And uh, the information about it is ably been compiled in your little program there. Uh, and uh, and so uh, it's very exciting for me that Princeton Symphony is going to perform this piece, and especially exciting to have Rossin because he's from Bulgaria. Uh, so it's it's quite unusual to get a Bulgarian conductor. Maybe the only time uh, that I ever get a Bulgarian conductor to do the piece. So uh, so I'm very excited about that. And uh, he's a wonderful conductor. He conducts all over the world. Uh, has an orchestra in Bulgaria. Uh, works with two different orchestras here. In addition to being, uh, I don't know if you're still doing assistant work some in Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah, and 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 so he's all over the place, guest conducting, doing lots of stuff, and he's a wonderful conductor. So uh, so thanks for coming, and I'm going to turn this over to Rossin and you know, see what he has has to say about about Bulgarian music in general. Thank you, Derek, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk about what I love, which is music, and uh, to do it together with Derek here in this very special place. The Institute for Advanced Studies uh, is always such a treat. Uh, the, the DVD that, you're, uh, that is going to be playing on the background is uh, something which was compiled by the Bulgarian Ministry of Culture on the occasion of Bulgaria joining the European Union back in 2007. So it uh, showcases some of the most important Thracian uh, treasuries found on the territory of Bulgaria. So as we are talking, you're going to see a lot of images from my country. I thought it was going to be very appropriate since the subject of our talk tonight is uh, pretty much an American in Bulgaria and a Bulgarian in America. And uh, how exactly this, uh, uh, this misplaced, uh, uh, I guess, uh, artistic uh, 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 journeys are going to produce something together on stage this, uh, this Sunday uh, at, uh, at the Richardson Hall. Uh, it's not a secret that um, Derek is a person that uh, has quite uh, wide interests, not only in uh, the music that he was born into, but also through his numerous journeys around the world. He has been exposed to probably more different and varied music than all of us put together. And I am sure many of you already have followed Derek's career quite closely in the last couple of years since he joined the Institute for Advanced Studies. So we are not going to go deeply into his uh, uh, travel itineraries from the last 10 years, but uh, I would like to touch uh, a little bit more in detail about his visit to Bulgaria and what exactly he learned over there and how he incorporated it in the piece that you're going to hear this Sunday here. I also would like to uh, mention something else that this CD, which is Derek's CD, which has the original recording of this piece, was the first CD that Melanie Clark, our executive director, gave me when I was appointed as music director of the Princeton Symphony, and said, uh, uh, here, uh, this, is, this CD, just listen to it, because uh, 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 this is music that I absolutely love. And I did not know Derek personally at that time. I have heard through the, the grapevine a lot of wonderful things about him as a composer and as a clarinet player. So to my in big Bulgaria. surprise, I turned there and track number two is called Thracian Echoes. And I said, wait a minute, Thracian Echoes, this is in Bulgaria. What, what business does an American composer have writing in Bulgarian style? You know, we have plenty of Bulgarian composers that do that. As a matter of fact, that's the only style that they're writing to. So, 
what does he know about Bulgarian music? And then I turned it on and I played this beautiful piece of 19 minutes and 23 seconds and uh, uh, greatly played by the Boston Modern Orchestra Project uh, with uh, Gil Rose conducting it. And I said, I have to do this piece. And this was one of the first pieces that I put on my schedule as a music director of the Princeton Symphony. So this is the background of it. And this is how we met with Derek at uh, his first event here at the Institute for Advanced Studies. So it was uh, a very fortunate meeting. And I feel like uh, I should give Melanie a check now. But, uh, uh, or something. No, Melanie, Melanie she's, she's this miracle maker in our organization. She connects people. I think not only musically, but also in the community here in Princeton. So, uh, Melanie, thank you for all of it. That, that's where she is. And we could, you could certainly give her an applause. She deserves it. She doesn't get it because she doesn't perform, but yeah. Thank you, Mel, for everything. And, I'm, and this is the score, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it around. Because one thing is to, we are very visual nowadays. So you could just browse through it. There's a lot of my notes, a lot of Derek's original notes, and uh, you will see how it is, looks. Is this the score that you conduct from? Yeah. So they're going to see all your markings in. Yeah, they're going to see. When he clarifies the, the things that exactly. I, I write. Yeah. So we don't need to refer to it right now. Is it? OK. All right. That's a little better, isn't it? So if you just don't mind passing it on. So D D Derek, maybe. Um, in a nutshell, what, what attracted you to Bulgaria? Why did you decide to go there? I know that for clarinet, there was this iconic figure of, of a Bulgarian clarinet player that everyone was, was talking as one of the seven wonders in the world. How was that possible to be done on a clarinet? And I know a lot of people that have been asking me, what's, what's wrong with this guy? How can he play so fast? And was that Nicola, the reason? Are you talking about Nicola? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, the, you know, Bulgaria, uh, there are certain countries that seem to have uh, a penchant for uh, having profound music, <laughs> producing profound music. Uh, it's mostly folk music, though, you know? Uh, yeah, it's, oh, it's yeah. something that sure. was produced sure. as a result of, 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 of uh, uh, filtering through many centuries of, of history. But it, it's, uh, as, as professional music, I, don't, I think we're more famous for being performers rather than creators. Oh, sure. Right, right, right. But, uh, Not... Folklore is certainly very interesting, yes. Oh, yeah, Just I mean, clarify. And I find them, they're kind of dispersed around the globe. I mean, one happens to be Bulgaria, one happens to be Ireland, you know, I mean... Uh, um, the, I mean, but 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 there are these kind of focal points. For some reason, the folk music has evolved to this very high state, and uh, um, maybe because of lack of, may, maybe because a lot of the great composers are in the are in the folk tradition. But um, in any case, B Bulgaria, it's it's funny, and it maybe because of what you described about it being having isolated pockets, uh, which which became very rich in and um, into and amongst themselves and less contact amongst the different uh, parts, primarily because of the terrain and it being very rural and hard to get from one place to another. But for some reason, you know, I heard Bulgarian, I heard two aspects of Bulgarian music. I heard the beautiful choirs that you may have heard. They're, they tend to be uh, all or mostly women, uh, female choirs, uh, which became popularized when that group Les Mystères des Voix Bulgares was touring around the world and their song was on the top charts along with chant and other uh, phenomena. I actually visited the Johnny Carson show. It's available on YouTube if you want to just Google Johnny Carson yeah. and the Bulgarian uh, uh, female yeah. choir. You could just see the whole episode. It's kind of funny. It's Yeah, <laughs> incredible. And, and then there were copycat choirs too that kind of proliferated but this is one tradition which which is very strong with beautiful kind of uh, chords that are uh, very what we would call close harmony extremely extremely uh, tight close harmony um, and then uh, which is similar to the Russian choirs in a way but with their own kind of flavor and harmony um, and then I also simultaneously I was hearing this very manic kind of fast, fast music uh, played by the folk musicians, mostly the instru instrumental musicians, obviously, uh, and sometimes with vocals as well, but uh, people like Nicola, uh, who I went later to study with. Um, I met his son in New York, uh, Ilian. Yes, yes. And Ilian was studying at Juilliard. He was studying the clarinet also at Juilliard. And I heard him play in a Henry Cowell piece. And I said to myself, 
that something is special about that clarinet player. And I went up afterwards and I went to talk to him. Now, Henry Cowell's an American composer. It was a very, but there was something about the way he was playing those licks that just sounded different. And I, I went up, sought him out afterwards, and I said, um, Ilyan, are you, where are you from? And he said, Bulgaria. And I said, aha. So you must play the folk music. No, 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 I'm a classical player. I'm a classical player. But later on, I, w I went to talk to another Bulgarian friend of mine, who you probably also know since it's a close community, Biljana Vuchkova. And Biljana was a wonderful violinist. And Biljana said to me, uh, there's a, you know, I had mentioned to her I wanted to go study in Bulgaria because I'd heard this wonderful folk music. And she said, oh, well, I know, I know you, there's a great, great guy named Nikola Ilyev. And I said, oh, is he related to Ilyan Ilyev, who is in New York? Yeah, it's his father. So, of course, I hadn't known that, and I went back to Ilya, and I said, you learned from your father. And he said, yeah, yeah, I, well, you know, I know a few things. Of course, when I got over there, Ilyan was there for just for a few days in, in, in Plovdiv, where I went eventually to study with Nicola, and he played, and he was superb, playing the folk music. I mean, he play, we, it was a wedding. We all got up to play. I played Ilyan, and Ilyan was fantastic. But he keeps that under wraps because he wants to be the classical guy, you know. Uh, but... Uh, and, and this is, you know, this is a tension. This is an issue that comes up in our music all the time. People who play jazz don't want to be known as a jazz composer because then they'll, they won't get the, you know, the possibility of writing classical. I mean, Duke Ellington fought against this and Gershwin, and then it goes the other way as well. So, um, so anyway, that was, that was my introduction. And then I, I went over to study with Nicola. One thing Ilyan told me, he told me his dad was a great teacher, had taught people from all over the world, was fantastic, great player. The one thing he neglected to tell me, which I found out at the very first lesson, was that he doesn't speak English. <laughs> but, you know, studying music, there's only so much you can communicate in words, and sometimes words get in the way. So I had found this also studying in Africa years before when I studied the xylophone. And, and, and so, you know, with a bit of grunting and kind of back and forth, uh, and I learned a few Bulgarian phrases. He didn't learn any English, was not interested. Uh, and his, his nephew spoke French, so every now and then, when we got in a fight, I would have to call his nephew, and his nephew would have to kind of uh, go back and forth. It's like the diplomats, forth. you'll fight in French. <laughs> exactly, it's much more cultured, yeah. It feels more cultured anyway. Um, uh, so anyway, that's where, I, and, and, and Nicola was uh, himself a wedding musician. He uh, he played, you know, throughout the area, and he played this style that he referred to as Thrakia, which is, would be called Thrace. And I want to ask you something, since there are probably some people here who want to know. In fact, I know there's at least one who wants to know. What is Thrace? Where is Thrace? Well, Thrace comes from... And this uh, is a trick question, because remember, there's yeah. some very knowledgeable people out here. Well, so. <laughs> Thrace is a name, a name that the Greek gave to this entire area. So it was, uh, according to the ancient Greeks, Thrace was the name of the province of that part of the world, but it was never quite defined because uh, these this, this, uh, lands at their time were uh, lands of barbarians. So you, you had uh, visitors as far as Asia, and as a matter of fact, this is how the Bulgarian nation was, was formed at um, 681st uh, year of, uh, of, of, uh, after Christ. And uh, it was compounded of the Thracians, that were the native people, the Slavic people that came from the north, and the Proto-Bulgarians that came from uh, Central Asia. So the Proto-Bulgarians are actually closer related to the Koreans, for instance, because they came from the same pool. And those are nomadic tribes that traveled great distances, so they came to where Bulgaria was and they formed the first government. It was a very strong government because they, they knew how to fight on horses, and this was something unheard of at uh, the lands of Europe at that time. And um, I guess from the Thracians that uh, they inherited this absolutely amazing culture of uh, working with metals and with gold, that you could see some wonderful examples of really some of the earliest gold found in the world anywhere. And uh, but from the Slavic people, uh, of course, they, they, they inherited uh, perhaps their sentimentality that you could see in a lot of Bulgarians nowadays. So it's an interesting... Um, uh, composed material at the very end of the day. But I, I was thinking, since you are holding your clarinet here, and you spoke about uh, Ilian playing in that style, and then you spoke about you studying over there, can you give us a little bit of an example of what that Bulgarian folk music would sound on the clarinet? Well, and then you could just leave it inside and we could move on to your music and how you do that with uh, orchestra. You know, I wrote this... Uh 
I, I, brought, I brought these Notna Tetratkas, which are my, <laughs> my uh, notebooks that I took all my notes in while I was in Bulgaria, notes, literal notes, uh, but they were uh, essentially transcriptions of what Nicola was playing. He would play something and I would say, hmm, and he would say, hmm, and then I would write down what he played and different, and I would practice them in all different keys and I would go home that night and then we'd have these four hour lessons which were just basically him playing at me and me writing down as fast as I could and saying, you know, again, again, and he would play it again. Um, and then he would look at it and say, yeah, yeah, you know, he would, he would point out where I was wrong and, you know, um, and, and he could read music, but uh, it's, they notate things slightly differently. So I have these notebooks here. I mean, I can't obviously show them to you. We don't have a machine for that. But, uh, but if anybody's curious to look at what I did notate when I was there, you can look at these notna tetratka um, uh, here where I notated all this stuff. Um, yeah, the sound, if I were to look at some of this, you know, you might see something that, that sounds something like this, uh, which is, this is, I think, the paidushko. Song, just yeah, the word. Five eight, right? Yeah, fine, okay. five eight. Like that. It sounds, sounds very authentic to me. Yeah. Does it? You're a good student, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a good imitator, right? You have to kind of be to do music on some level. Um, that's how you learn. But, uh, yeah, actually, Nicola told me, if I stay, he said, if you stay for three years, well, he didn't say it in English, but if he said, if you stay, I don't know what he said, but it was translated, uh, if you stay for three years, you'll be the greatest Bulgarian clarinetist. <laughs> I said, well, that's not really my ambition, but... Um, but of course, I had to say, well, next to you, you know, of course, you know, that was a trick question, I think, or a trick statement of his. Um, but what's interesting is um, about that, just to say one technical thing about that, if I play it slow for you and I show you the five, there's something very interesting that happens. Because, of course, one of the things I found interesting about Bulgarian music is that it's not all in time signature, this is the way we musicians tend to be reductionist and we divide everything up uh, to, to find the structure and we tend to divide things into threes and fours, so like a waltz, boom, gun, gun, boom, gun, gun, right? Or, or a march, one, two, da, 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 one, two, three, four, right? So that's how we tend to divide things up. But the Bulgarians have time signatures, we call these time signatures, three beats, four beats. The Bulgarians have time signatures which are very odd like five or seven or even 11 or 13, you know. So these are very, very difficult, especially try to dance in 13. Numbers that cannot divide. <laughs> right, 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 right. A lot of them are prime numbers, yeah. right, exactly. So, um, yeah. so, uh, so for example, if I slow it down for you, you'll hear the five here. I'm gonna play you a slightly different version just so you can hear the five. Ornaments, yeah. yeah, ornaments. Okay. yeah. One of the interesting things about that is that if you notice, that little trill ends up going over the beat. So that when I'm changing from, to, from one measure to the next measure, the next group of five, it goes the, the, it sustains over that. So actually it obscures, it blurs that change of beat, which I found very fascinating. Um, and, and also, you kind of hear that echoing sound. It, you, know, you play the one phrase and the next phrase kind of echoes it. You know, so it has that same kind of echoing sound. So now you, you get this strange blurred thing
the reason this, this is a nerdy thing, the reason this interests me as a composer, it's just because it, it was something that I'd never heard before. It was, they were playing in an odd meter, like five or seven, but then they were, then, when, then they were kind of blurring that division so that then you ended up with a kind of an even sound. It was, it, um, there's something, you know, they, they were taking these larger groups. So you were really playing more, the, this phrase ends up being in 15 plus five, more than it ends up being in five, 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 five. And then when you play it fast, you almost can't hear the five anymore. So if I asked you to dance to that, you'd need to drink quite a bit of rakia before you could do that. Yes, um, th th this is actually one of the least complicated uh, the, the rhythms that, uh, that Derek explained so beautifully and so eloquently uh, to us. Uh, and as he said, this, this gets more and more complicated. So what he does in his piece, uh, actually the first set number that you have in your piece, because the structure of the work uh, is such that it's, 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 a, it's an impression. On, on his trip to Bulgaria. That's the way I see it. it. I know it's much easier for someone else to talk about your music than for you to talk yourself about it. But the way I see it as a person coming from Bulgaria, it starts with this very beautiful and atmospheric uh, idea of, uh, of space, of almost timeless uh, introduction to it. And then it goes through series of almost conversational type of sounds that he perhaps heard in the Bulgarian language that you can't really hear in any other place on earth. So it has this uniqueness stamp of, of uh, Bulgarian ideas, Bulgarian sounds at first. Then we move on to, um, uh, to something that he calls the Paidushko Horo, which in Bulgaria is that dance in 5-8. And he develops this, but he notates it in a very Western type of way. He does not notate it in 5-8, he notates it in 4-4. So when the orchestra has to play, they have to divide inside those set vessels of, of, of bars that we have in music, or the distance between two of those big vertical lines in the score. And, and make it sound very uneven. Then he goes on to a more complicated dance, then he goes to a beautiful slow melody, almost like the lyrical center of, of the work, and then he goes into something extremely complicated that combines all of his ideas at the very end, which is the big apotheosis at the end of the work. So maybe, um, I think it would be very interesting, I have prepared a little surprise for him, because I didn't really warn him what I was going to do. I was going to, I'm going to play some examples of his music, and then I'm going to play some examples of authentic Bulgarian pieces that uh, perhaps he heard. So you could see how he uh, uses that unique sound of the Bulgarian female choir and how he orchestrates it, let's say, for the orchestra. So I'm just going to play perhaps two things. I'm going to play the opening of Derek's piece first. So we'll take things in chronological order. And I have to exit this presentation and go on to my iTunes, which should not be too difficult. One thing I wanted to say about this transformation aspect is that uh, one of the things that I found was that, you know, composition is a lot about transformation. So, so you know, you can have an inspiration, and if you transform it enough uh, by changing different aspects of it, uh, you can completely transform the material to be something totally different. So that's what I tried to do, change the, change the uh, keep some of the rhythmic and ornamental aspects of the music, but change certain things to see how a new language could be created. So change the harmony, change the tempo, change, uh, change the form, you know. So I'm ready, I think. And this is how Derek's piece starts.
And then let's hear a, a, a small example of a, of a song which is sung in a traditional Bulgarian there. Quite strikingly similar, right? The, as, as a gesture. Uh, perhaps one thing that we could mention it as an element of the style is you could hear that almost entirely the Bulgarian music is composed of these very small intervals. And, uh, yeah, because everything that you just mm -hmm. heard encompasses less than an octave. Yeah. All those voices, uh, except that low thing at the end, but, but yeah, it encompasses, is, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like a pedal. But, that, but the rest of it, really, it's very, very contained. And even like intervals that are smaller than what we have on the piano nowadays, which is what we have on the piano is just a half step. But in Bulgarian music, we have steps that are smaller than the half step. So when you go and uh, let's say you're classically trained and you go to these old ladies that live in the village and sing in that style. And if you start playing everything on the piano, they said, you know what, this actually sounds out of tune. <laughs> it does not go like that. It needs to be much closer. Yeah, the, so they're I, looking for the tension. Oh yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it's this is another thing. It's Bulgaria is this interesting place. It's kind of you know close to it because it borders on uh, Czech Republic, I think, right? Uh, not part, on Czech no, not, Republic. Not quite. No, it's uh, Serbia to the west and Romania to the north. And Serbia to the west. Okay, yes. right. So Romania mm -hmm. is just north. So mm -hmm. it's kind of near the, the Western European countries, but not that near. It's connected to the Western European countries because of the Danube River. The Bulgaria right. is uh, it's, right. it's at the very end of the Danube where it flows into the Black Sea. So it has always been that artery that connects Bulgaria to Vienna, for instance. So a lot of the influences in Bulgaria are Viennese. You go to Sofia, the architecture is very Viennese, at least what was left from... Uh, uh, you know, before the war. But the then bombings. it's also, it borders <laughs> on, on, on Turkey. Yes, and, and Greece. And, and, and then there's the Slavic influence, and, 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 then, and then Greece, right. Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of Balkan influence of these crazy, this music, mm -hmm. you know, this very spirited or, or music. almost Oriental, because a lot mm -hmm. of this music you could, found in, you could find in um, some of the Mid-Eastern music, or sure. even as far as Indian music, so. Yeah, and in Turkey, they, they're always using those intervals, mm -hmm. those, those kind of, in the voice, you hear those, uh, you know, those kinds of, I did that very badly, but. Um, yeah. Um, another example from uh, Derek's music. This is going to be a place in uh, his work which um, which imitates this typical sound of Bulgarian female choir. And these women, they're trained to sing that way. This is not the natural voice uh, that, uh, that they produce. Their, their range, as you mentioned, is very limited because what they do, they don't really use any any of the traditional resonance that we have in classical training. They just go with direct sound that comes from their vocal cords. So if they have ah, and they just make it very nasal and they really sort of expose the vocal cords to you. So that's why it sounds really loud and it sounds almost always without any vibrato or without anything like that, very primal type of sound. And this is allows you to mm -hmm. imitate it on an instrument. And this is how easily. Derek imitates it now. I'm going to play a little bit of that uh, sound first. Uh, and let's see what I have here for that. Uh, all right. Mm -hmm. 
You get the idea, and now I'm going to jump to a particular spot of Derek's piece, which is going to be 9 minutes and 30 seconds into it. Let's see if I could find it. Sorry. So how do you do this? What's the what, what is the recipe for this? Uh, well, dish? good chef never. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, the Bulgarians, uh, like in that excerpt you played, uh, quite often things originate from a unison, everyone singing on the same pitch, and then they move slightly out from that and then back in. And it's a very particular kind of sound. Actually, you get it in Gregorian chant, too. There, there are aspects of this that sound quite similar to a lot of chant. And I think that that's not an accident. It's because the, 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 the Orthodox Church is still quite strong there. And a lot of the ceremonies are held uh, in a way that might resemble uh, the way they were held years ago. Um, I mean, centuries ago. But um, so many of those aspects of, of the plain chant are you know, still around today in the, in the ceremonies that, uh, that, that, that permeate um, the country. But uh, I would say that orchestrationally, I mean, there are two aspects. One is the, uh, the harmony, and that, 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 that comes, or it's, it's very linear. I, I, so when you say harmony, I, I think one of the things that attracted to me about Bulgarian music, because I'm a melody guy, because I play a, you know, instrument that only plays one note, at a time, you know, unless you do something like this. But, you know, we don't have to go into that. Uh, most of the time it just plays one note at a time. Um, not like a pianist. And so a lot of people who play piano are more oriented toward harmony. I'm very oriented toward melody and counterpoint. So counterpoint means one thing against another. And that's what happens. You have everybody in a unison and then they move out from there and back in and back out and back in. And orchestrationally, uh, I was, you know, using, you'll hear like the, a muted trumpet and an oboe together, which are both very nasal sounds. Uh, it, it has to do with this, the sonic spectrum and which harmonics are accentuated when a trumpet puts in a mute or when an, an oboe plays. I mean, it, it limits the, uh, the spectrum, uh, but, but these are both happen to be kind of nasal sounds. So I use them together like one instrument, which is what you do when you orchestrate. You essentially create new instruments by combining instruments. It's like having a big palette of colors and you just, you know, you, have a, you can put a solo violin with a bassoon. How does that sound together? Well, you, you try it out and see what, what's, what's that hybrid sound. And so that's, that's what I did in that case. When you orchestrated this piece, were you? Um, these are quite unusual combinations that you don't hear in uh, too much of the of the music which is out there and which we call classical. Do you experiment with musicians? Do you ask them to uh, to combine their sounds before you commit to paper? You just have this very wild imagination, so you know if I put this in this. I know what is going to sound like. What what is your process of orchestrating? Because I find this such a strong element in your uh, music writing. It seems like uh, the color already exists when you write a particular line, which is kind of unique. And how 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 do you do this? What is what is the the secret of it? How do you orchestrate? Well, um that's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, I, I, I learned, or I can tell you how I learned orchestration mm -hmm. was, you know, I, I studied in Israel with a guy named Andre Haidu, and he, uh, you know, he put me in a, you know, I mean, he, he basically said to me, okay, here are two pieces by Haydn, go study these, uh, these orchestra pieces, and I studied several symphonies of Haydn, and then we came in, and we talked about them the next day. He asked me, what what did you think about the range? What did you find out? What did you learn? Then he would give me two piano pieces by Haydn and say, go home and orchestrate these, come back next week. So I, in the style of Haydn. So I did that. Then the next week it was Mozart. The next week it was 
Beethoven, the next week it was Schubert, the next week it was Brahms, the next week it was Debussy, the next week it was Bartok, the next week it was Stravinsky, you know, Tchaikovsky. So, you know, you study the greats and you imitate them. I mean, that's what I did for a year. I came in every week and I imitated somebody else. Uh, you learn some of their tricks, you learn maybe some of the things that you don't like, actually, and that was always just as interesting to talk about the stuff I didn't like as the stuff I did like, uh, and I did them by hand, you know, and even when I teach orchestration, I always tell students, you know, take a page of your favorite music and copy it over, or two pages, a place you really like, if you like the Firebird by Stravinsky, if you like John Adams, if you like Monteverdi, copy it over by hand. And they can't believe I'm saying by hand, you know. They want to do it at the computer or they want to Xerox it, you know. But this is the age of Xerox, you know. But we need to be able to actually replicate it in our, in our brains. So, so to me, I mean, that's, I think I learned from just studying really good composers. When I hear, what I hear in my head is usually, I, I kind of hear, uh, I, I try to imagine the different combinations and colors together. Uh, now, this is going to sound pretty mundane. It doesn't... But somehow, I try things maybe that I wouldn't... I, I Often I'd like to try one instrument in a register that's not its normal register, maybe, and another instrument in a register. Like, I might, if I did that violin and bassoon when I said that, for example, that's a combination you would never see because their ranges almost don't overlap, but there is a little bit where they do overlap. There's about an octave where they overlap. Um, in fact, there's even more than that. Um, but you have to know a lot to be able to do that because you have to know what, you know, if you fail, it's good to fail epically, I think. So, you know, really fail, <laughs> fail, fail better. That's Beckett. But I think if you, um, if you, I mean, I, I'm thinking of one moment when I was composing a woodwind quintet and I had this very low flute line and then it just transferred to the bassoon and it sounded like the same instrument because the bassoon way up sounds like a flute, actually. It sounds kind of, for a while it starts to sound like a saxophone, then it starts to sound like a flute, and then it just stops, you know. But it's interesting how that happens. The instruments become something very different in a different range, and I think that's one of the things you have to know about when you're orchestrating. Uh, you know, a trumpet, for example. I mean, a trumpet, well, first of all, with a mute, a trumpet is totally different. I and mean, when you look at scores by somebody like Wynton Marsalis, in some ways, certain, the string parts are kind of like whatever, but the, you know, the trumpet parts, you could learn a lot by studying Winton's trumpet parts. They all use different mutes. He's using a bucket mute in one and a cup mute in the other and a straight mute in the other. And, you know, it's incredible. So um, anyway, I mean, that's, that's a long answer to just say there's a lot out there to learn and you have to but study the great But it seems to me that particularly when, to, to get back to the trace and echoes, it seems to me that the, one of the objectives of you writing this piece was to imitate... The, uh, the, the the colors that you heard in Bulgaria, and I must say that uh, the the way you uh, managed to solve those challenges is absolutely spectacular. Because elements of it sound like the guidas, which is this Bulgarian bagpipe instrument, and elements of it sounds like but Bulgarian singing, or uh, or many many examples like this in this piece. You so, know, sounds that we hear every day that we think of or musical sounds are actually much more complex than we often give them credit for because often a sound will have overtones that we, we, we hear in the sound when you're listening, like when you hear my voice, there's these higher overtones that are happening every time I speak. You're, it's not just on the note that I speak, but you're also hearing other things that you may not even know about. And Ravel was great at finding those things. He could, in, in, you know, you hear uh, in, 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 even in something like uh, uh, Bolero, you know, he, when he repeats that melody, he's got another really high note in the piccolo up there, and it's on a strange interval, like a third, and it sounds like an organ stop an organ pipe because it's accentuating a very strange interval but it becomes a hybrid sound and that's what you do when you orchestrate you create these interesting hybrid sounds and I, I, I think I try to not go for the obvious solution which sometimes takes a little more time for the orchestra maybe to learn because they're thinking what am I doing here but then they hear oh I'm playing with the you know, the timpani, or I'm playing with the trombone. And then they, they start to hear the other person who's playing that along with them, and then they learn who their partner is in this hybrid sound. Very, very interesting. Maybe we'll play a little bit more music now from, uh, from, from your piece. I would like to get to that part that uh, uh, you get kind of uh, wild with your meters, but before that I would like to demonstrate for you an example of 
11.16. And let's see if you could actually participate in our lecture by discovering, yeah, how exactly are we going to, to count this if, you, if, let's say, if you have to, to, to clap your hands with the meter. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Now, something similar from Derek's music. Do, do these... Oh. That's his big accumulation, very close to the end. And the same idea of many, many layers on the top of each other. Wonderful, wonderful piece. It's, it's just uh, uh, absolutely remarkable. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very, very impressed. It, at the moments, it almost sounds like uh, you know the, the the type of things that Messiaen would write based on on, on uh, all the gamelan music, and uh, it, it it really builds all these interesting bridges. He was the composer bridges. that he was yes. the composer that made me want to be a composer when I heard his music when I was 13, mm -hmm. and I thought. I remember looking at the program of the the uh, um, of the of the piece uh, uh, of the program of the concert and seeing you know Messiaen and I didn't really know I knew he was a composer but I thought whatever that guy does that's what I want to do. <laughs> oh, so what what is what is Derek writing now? Derek is writing. Uh, actually, I'm finishing. I'm I'm in a, a hibernation phase of finishing two orchestra pieces. At the same time, their premiere is a week apart, which is not a position that anybody wants to be. It's like having to deliver two major lectures, you know, a couple of days apart. Uh, one is an electric guitar concerto, which is for a consortium, well, two orchestras, one in um, Albany and one in uh, the Netherlands. And the other is uh, 
a, a, a piece for a, a Brazilian <coughs> uh, singer named Luciana Souza, who's a, 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 a bossa nova, and off, most, mostly she sings kind of bossa nova and jazz and samba, uh, but she also sings classical music. She's done a lot of work with Osvaldo Galeja, for example, the, the um, Argentinian composer, and um, she's really wonderful. She lives out in LA, and so they're gonna premiere the piece um, out in LA, and it's in Portuguese, the text, so. Uh, I'm trying to brush up. <laughs> Derek speaks a little bit of Bulgarian, so if you would like to communicate oh, secretly, no, no. we could do that. Um, less and less. Well, I, I hope that uh, uh, certainly this this meeting and this conversation and these demonstrations would uh, would, would whet your appetite for uh, for the concert uh, this Sunday, and uh, we'll have another lecture. Uh, I guess, uh, a brief lecture before the concert when we will include not only this piece but the context of the entire program which also includes Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra. Yeah, which, which itself is a the great same good reason to come. same sort yeah. of principle. How do you write in the style of uh, something which has been created as folk music before? Well, I and think this is a, it's a great program because it involves uh, you know, a, a 20th century work, uh, a 19th century work. Uh, it, well, it involves Dvorak. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely, uh, yeah, yeah, Dvorak is a 19th because, century work. Yeah, sure, and it's it's in uh, the Czech folk tradition. Czech, and then you have you have this these three kind of Eastern European dealing with Czech, Hungary, Hungary, and uh, Bulgaria, and one is 21st century, obviously, just about. Um, and so, uh, so it's, it's quite interesting to see the different approach. I think it's great programming, especially because he chose my piece. But, uh, um, but I mean, are there any questions that yes, people want to? Yes, that would wanna... be a good time for, for questions now, if you, if you have anything, both to me or to Derek. Yes. They are all difficult, but uh, you know we have an absolutely fantastic orchestra, and uh, Derek was there at the first rehearsal the other day. I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but I was uh, very proud of the way the orchestra read the piece at the first rehearsal, uh, with all the challenges, with all the the special things that they were asked to do throughout the piece. And uh, it's, it's a fantastic orchestra. I mean, it really, uh, you know, Princeton's a small town, but. They draw a really great orchestra, a lot of terrific players, um, some are f who are in town, but many are from out of town, and uh, I mean, it's just a stunning group, great players. And it's hard for me, because uh, the, believe it or not, this type of music is very difficult to conduct, because most of the time you, you have to be a, a traffic cop, very, very busy traffic cop. <laughs> but, but one thing he did do, which I think is very important, is to explain to the players about the piece. Sometimes conductors, uh, usually I, I find you get one of two things with a conductor that they will explain it right before the dress rehearsal. They say, oh, you know what, we never talked about what this piece is about. It's about Bulgarian folk music. There's all these different kinds of Bulgarian folk music and this has a lot of different Bulgarian folk music. One, one you know, in four different sections, a lot of close harmony, kind of like, in other words, they do what he just did, but uh, in about 30 seconds, and they say, okay, let's play. <laughs> so that's, that's the only context that they get, but uh, I think Rossin took some time to talk to them a little bit about, uh, about, about the music, and I think it made them, put them in a certain mindset. I mean, it, you know, when I'm playing music, I, I, as a performer, I mean, I, I wanna know what I'm playing. I don't just wanna play some random notes and try to put them together. I want to have some insight into what's going on. I mean, it's so. such a foreign language to most of them because, believe it or not, our training uh, is, is mostly based on what they teach you at Juilliard School, let's say. And this is something very traditional. We could understand the language of Beethoven, language of Brahms, language of Mozart, perhaps Stravinsky, Tchaikovsky, maybe Bartok, but no one really, really teaches you to understand these pieces with very heavy foreign accents, such as this one. So most of the time, people, uh, they, they don't know exactly what, what to expect. They, they try to... To, um, to see it to the, through the prism of what they already know, but this is very, very different. And I, would, I would go even farther and say that, you know, it affects the way people play Brahms, because then they don't understand that Brahms loved Hungarian folk music, they loved the gypsy music, and, and, it, and when you play that clarinet quintet, and you're playing the second movement, and you play, and you play, it's not that, it's, you know, I mean, that's how Brahms, I mean, I can't imagine Brahms would have wanted you 
to sit there counting the exact beats like that. I can't imagine it that any composer would want you to do that. It just and these are things that you can't really notate in the score. So these are the things why we have to communicate with with, with people that have heard it, like your teacher in Bulgaria. Because you, you hear it and then you understand it, but you, these are things that you could not notate on a piece of paper or you could not talk about. No, you have there to certain actually things have fights. You have to hear, yes. You have to have fights. You have to sit with them. You have to argue with them. You'd say, but that's not what is, yes, that is the way, you know, and no, yes, you know, and then I'm going to show you. And one time he just stormed out. He stormed out and he didn't come back and his... His his nephew said, "I'm very sorry." You know, I'm sorry. you know, and he kind of went, finally got him and brought him back. And then he said, "He says, you know, my uncle says we must go to talk to the musicologist." So I said, "Where's the musicologist?" He says, "At the university." So I said, "Now?" He says, "Yes, he will not teach you again until we speak with the musicologist." So I went and we talked, we, we went down, you probably know this guy, I don't know, he teaches at the University of Plovdiv, he's, you know, a musicologist, and I said, but this is what I wrote, it's in 11, he said, no, no, Bulgarian doesn't think of it this way, well, Bulgarian thinks of it in this meter, that's not an eighth note, that's a, you know, and I would have to, I said, but that's what my ears tell me, he said, but that's you, you have to think of this the way you have to notate it the way a bulgarian musician would notate it not just because you have to feel it the way they feel it and i mean these are the kinds of experiences you have that you can't get when you go on youtube or something like that i mean it just doesn't no. come out and um, not that youtube i love youtube i love it but if it, you if you manage to study in bulgaria for as long as i did and i went for as high as i could uh, bulgarian folklore was uh, studied for 5 years on the university level so oh because of the complexity, because of all the different genres and different regions that it comes from. But nobody's required to study jazz here. No, but we did it for five years, and guess what? The final exam was you go there, and you, you take a piece of paper, and then you see what's printed there. They ask you to sing several songs from a different region. They ask you to dance several dances, which you were supposed to memorize, and, of course, to talk about it separately. So. I am very proud that my nation has uh, paid such an incredible attention, not only to researching the folklore, but to making sure that everyone that has the title musician in their diploma makes sure that it's part of that tradition. Because I, I could only dream that this could happen uh, you know, in, in, in every other place, because it's not possible. It, 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 you have to have not only the incredible pride of, uh, of what has been created before you, but also to make sure that you understand that the future is in that. And uh, obviously, it, it was good enough to impress uh, a, a composer that was born in America. And uh, yeah. I'm very proud of it. And I'm extremely pleased that I will be doing this piece by Derek on this concert. Any other questions, maybe? Yes, ma'am. The original ones were always a cappella, but uh, you could also hear arrangements, let's say, if they put a show together that, uh, that travels and they will, they will incorporate, in this case, uh, uh, an orchestra of Bulgarian folk instruments for some of the numbers, but uh, their biggest numbers were the ones that they would sing a cappella, just like the examples that you heard right now. About 40 people often, you know, it's a big, big group. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Question? Yes, Dave. No, no, because this was in addition to our classical training. This was not the only uh, system that they used. We were trained in the Western tradition, just like any other conservatory, but this was a bonus that we got for being born in Bulgaria. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Well, Maestro, thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, it's uh, taking time out of your schedule, uh, and, um, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to work with you, and, and uh, thanks for coming to the Institute. 
Thank you, Derek, for, for, for writing the music. Without the composers, we will be unemployed. <laughs> 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 Thank you. And I need the score back. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't play it. <laughs>